I want to give a special shout out to all my patrons first. Thank you so much to my Biblio Spran, Biblio Howlers, Bibliomancer, and my new Bibliomancer, Garrick. It means a lot to me that you give me your extra support toward my passion and hobby. Hi everyone, uh, Patek here. Today's video will be a spoiler-free book review of Two Green Angel Tower by Ted Williams and also a review, a serious review of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. And yes, this entire review will be spoiler-free. It is done. At 530,000 words long, Two Green Angel Tower is the largest single volume novel I have ever read in my life. It is a mesmerizing, slow burn epic fantasy tome imbued with high stakes, postponing final chapters. With that large word count uh, counted into consideration, I am feeling at a loss on how to unwrap my thoughts into a coherent review, but I shall try my best. I spent 18 days inside the world of Austin art uh, reading to Green Angel Tower. For several years now, I have always wanted to finish reading A Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy by Ted Williams, and now I've done it. I feel satisfied, not counting The Veiled Throne and Speaking Bones by Ken Liu as one, because they are originally one 700,000 words long book divided into two. Two Green Angel Tower is, as I said, the biggest single volume novel I have ever read in my life so far. And before you proceed to hear my review, I will first apologize now just in case I end up rambling, but I have a lot of thoughts I want to say in this review, and I want to deliver them. Like usual, this will be a spoiler-free book and series review, and my thoughts on whether to Green Angel Tower stick the landing. To Green Angel Tower is the third and final book in Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy. The story picks up from where Stone of Farewell ended. The evil minions of the undead city Storm King are beginning their final preparations for the kingdom-shattering culmination of their dark sorceries, drawing King Elias ever deeper into their nightmarish spell-spun world. As the Storm King's power grows and the boundaries of time blur, the loyal allies of Prince Joshua struggle to rally their forces at the Seduadra. There too, Simon and the surviving members of the League of the Scroll have gathered in a desperate attempt to unravel mysteries from forgotten past. For if the League can reclaim these age-old secrets of magic long buried beneath the dust of time, they may be able to reveal to Joshua and his army the only means of striking down the unslayable foe. The novel tackles the heavy themes of life, death, leadership, friendship, suffering, war, and redemption, to mention a few. As you can probably tell from the enormous word count, I do not count to Green Angel Tower as an easy read. If or when, modern fantasy readers tell me they feel burned out from the writing due to its length and slow pacing, I would actually understand. This is not the kind of fantasy tome you can read through quickly. The way to Green Angel Tower is slow and rewarding, and to get there, you have to really pay attention and be able to appreciate the wording. I will, however, maintain my notion. If you look at the characterizations, writing style, and pacing of The Realm of the Elderlings by Robin Hobb, there is a good chance you will love reading Memory, Sorrow, and Dawn trilogy. I am late to the party of Austin art. To Green Angel Tower was first published in the year 1993. That's 30 years ago. It was impossible for me to attain or read Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn uh, back then, but it is better late than never. And if you are a reader who is late, like me, meaning that uh, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy haven't been read by you yet, I want to help set your expectations accordingly. When people talk about Memory, Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn now, you will hear this series sparked the inspiration in numerous modern epic fantasy uh, author stories. The most popular ones are A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. Martin and also The Kingkiller Chronicle by Patrick Rothfuss. These authors explicitly spoke about the importance of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy to their writing craft and series. And you will find a lot of connection between Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy to A Song of Ice and Fire. I cannot deny I have a newfound appreciation for not only Tad Williams for writing the series, but also for George R. R. Martin in the way he used his inspirations and implemented them into his series without them ever feeling like copycats. But that is another topic for another day. Otherwise, this review will end up longer than it should be. More importantly, there is most likely one other thing you have heard from many other readers about this series. The first 200 pages of the Dragon Bone Chair are slow paced. This is true. But it is not the entire truth behind the pacing of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy. It is not just the first 200 pages of the Dragonborn Chair, 
but the entire trilogy is a slow burn epic fantasy series. For better or worse, uh, the slow burn narration of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn will be the crucial determining factor on whether you will like reading the series or not. I can safely say this. If you dislike the Dragonborn chair due to its slow pace, I do not think the rest of the trilogy will work better for you. You cannot start reading this trilogy with the expectations that the second half of the Dragonborn chair or the entirety of the Stone of Farewell or Two Green Angel Tower would have a faster paced narration accompanied with many battle scenes. You will be sorely disappointed. I am a fan of reading slow burn epic fantasy series. And even then, I still would love to know about this before I start reading uh, Stone of Farewell and To Green Angel Tower. Other readers might feel differently about this, but I found the pacing in the Dragonbone Chair to be the most balanced of the trilogy. It needs to be mentioned though, the slow paced narration was not a prominent detrimental point in my reading experience. Not at all. For several reasons I will discuss soon, it always feels good to be reading Tad Williams storytelling and Proust. And I sincerely hope you do not misconstrue my statement. For a trilogy this large, the number of vast pivotal battles or action sequences that occurred is less than 10 times. That is relatively few, especially compared to many modern epic fantasy series. But the impact the scenes have is nothing short of tremendous. Each book in a trilogy ended with a bang and the climax sequence into Green Angel Tower is one of the best I have ever read. The convergence at Hayhold were insane. The intensity was fully charged capped and escalated for the last more or less 200 pages of the book. The battles and the race against time were absolutely breathtaking. The scenes of decimation and the crimson light that shines in the darkness of the storm were so vivid in my imagination. Add all the revelations and answers regarding the three great swords and the cactus motivation we witnessed in the climax sequence to every fantastic point I just mentioned and it is no longer a surprise. How to Green Angel Tower catapulted itself into becoming one of my favorite books. It was crazy how great the final chapters were. I won't lie, there was a part of me that felt to Green Angel Tower was too long for its own good as I read my way through it. And at the end of the journey, I still think there were some parts that could be cut off from the book to strengthen the pacing. But the immensely impactful payoff at the end of To Green Angel Tower was worth reading every page of Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. I have become attached to a lot of the characters too. The trilogy is filled with a relatively extensive cast of characters. And the characters driven narration allowed me to easily care and be inside the POV character's mind, hearing their thoughts and understanding their reasons. Simon, Binabek, Joshua, Miriamel, Tiamak, Isgrim Nur, Meguin, Eoler, Jiriki, Kadrak, and more. I can't get into all the fine details on why many characters in the series were likable, flawed, and well written. But of course, this doesn't mean I like all of them. In my opinion, Herni's theory story, Meguin, and Eoler's POV chapters could have fewer spotlights, and it would hands down make the books better <laughs> for me. I started to feel invested in these two POV characters only from the middle of Two Green Angel Tower. Before that, it was a struggle to read through their chapters. And were there other frustrating parts with the characterizations or their decisions? Totally. Several life-changing important secrets were purposefully hidden by a few characters for a long time with similar reasons along the line of I can't talk about this, I can't talk about it, I want to tell you, but I can't, it brings me so much pain, and repeat. And obviously, they always end up telling their secrets anyway. Without spoilers, these scenes tested my patience. I am not a fan of this troupe, and the Wheel of Time is notorious for it. And for a while, this troupe plus the slow burn narrative of Two Green Angel Tower made me briefly sure I would not give this book a 5 out of 5 stars rating. Until I was proven wrong, as I said, by how much groundwork Tad Williams has prepared. Everything exploded brilliantly in the final 200 pages of Two Green Angel Tower. It was utterly incredible. Even though I have some issues with Two Green Angel Tower, the immersion of the world building, the lore, the flawed characters, the prose, and the climax sequences more than made up for them. Tad Williams stuck the landing. What I'm going to say next will be subjective, but for me, there is something about the world of Austin art that makes me want to go back to it again. I already felt this when I was reading The Dragon Bone Chair, and now that I'm done with the trilogy, I can already feel the pull of the world drawing me back in. The world building and lore in this trilogy are intricate and extraordinary. You will feel like you're really in Austin art. 
Escapism is one of the main reasons readers love reading fantasy novels and series, and Ted's writing can conjure that kind of vivid imagery and melancholic transportation. This pull and immersive reading experience is an irresistible charm of the Austin Art saga. I lost count of how many readers have mentioned reading The Dragonborn Chair always feels like coming back home. I can already feel that even though I just finished reading the series. The world of Austin art may brim with treachery and perilous times, but the beauty of the landscape and the calm before the storm moments were, in a contrasting way, as impactful as the devastating battles. Being back with the characters and the world of Austin art can bring comfort. I definitely would love to read what happens next after the end of The Green Angel Tower, to be back with all the surviving characters again. Fortunately, I will get what I wish for in the sequel series, The Last King of Austin Art. Lastly, I cannot end this review without briefly discussing our main character, Simon Mooncalf or Snowlock. I have read many fantasy books now, a lot of fantasy main characters with a similar background as Simon, but Simon does stand out from the rest. I love reading his story and his character development. Do I want to slap him at times? Oh you bet, Simon reminded me of Fitz on several occasions. Fitz from the realm of the Erdolings is another flawed and beloved character I want to slap multiple times throughout this series. Simon is not an exception to this, and yet I cannot help but still like him. His friendship with Binabek is so cherishable, his frustrations and tantrums with the state of the world felt believable. His feelings for Miriamel never felt out of place. He is a teenager and he behaves like one, and it is refreshing to see how much luck play a part in Simon's role and story. He is not a mega powerful character, but his kindness and willingness to do what is right, despite his fear, supported the construction of his luck. Despite all the development and his feats, Simon said it himself. He still has the heart of a scullion, and this is evident throughout the narrative. It makes his character development realistic and genuine. For its rewarding ending, satisfying reading experience, and irreplaceable achievement in the genre, I cannot give uh, To Green Angel Tower anything less than 5 stars rating. Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn is a classic epic fantasy that needs to be remembered and talked about more often by modern fantasy readers. Ted Williams clearly cared about the beauty and the flow of his prose. And the storytelling, the lore, and the writing are worth savoring. Take your time, appreciate the magnificence of Austin art. The Last King of Austin art is not as popular as Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy, but I heard from the fans of the series who continue their journey in Austin art that the sequel is even superior. I am incredibly excited to read them. I already own all the available books in the Austin Art Saga and I will read them all uh, next year in 2024. Until then, reading Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn together with my friends have been a precious uh, memory. And I want to close this review by thanking everyone who joined me in reading or rereading Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn trilogy. And yeah, I think that's pretty much my full thoughts regarding to Green Angel Tower and also Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. If you have read this book, of course, do let me know what you think about it. And do you agree that the book deserves to be called a classic epic fantasy now? And do you think it still deserves more recognition? Because I do believe that it deserves more recognition. Considering its status and achievement, this series isn't talked about as often as, let's say, The Lord of the Rings, A Song of Ice and Fire, or even the Stormlight Archive by Brandon Sanderson. And I think that really need to change in the future. I am really excited to read The Last King of Boston art next year. And before I forget, there will be a full series discussion between me and Alex from Tall Guy Reads on probably my channel or on Alex's channel. I will announce that when we have the date. And until then, as always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye-bye. Lastly, I want to say thank you so much once again to all my patrons who keep on supporting me.